Welcome back to another class of Reaching New Levels of Faith. This is class number seven. We're going to talk about the struggles of searching faith. And so get that Bible out. You can be turning that to John chapter 20. We'll be there in a moment. And also get out your, your study guide, your workbook, and we will be filling in the blanks with our PowerPoint that we'll be putting up on the screen for you. If I give you a pop quiz and I put this up on the screen, would you be able to fill in these blanks? And you should know the five levels of faith by now, imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, and mature faith. We pretty well talked about imitating faith and affiliating faith. Now I wanna talk about searching faith. And I've been spending the last few classes trying to convince you not to stay at affiliating faith to move forward, to go on and to search out your faith. Now that hopefully I've convinced you to do that, now I'm gonna tell you, you cannot have searching faith without struggle. Maybe you think, oh man, that was a mean trick. But it's the way that we think about struggle. You know, struggle is not always a bad thing. I heard this expression sometime back, this was years ago, and I've always liked this. Struggle helps us drive down the stakes to wreck the tent so we can weather the storm. I don't know if you've ever set up a, a tent before, but if you, you're climbing up in the mountains and you get to a spot where you want to camp, the first thing you've got to do is spread out the base of that tent and drive the stakes in the ground. That's what struggle is. It drives the stakes in the ground. And until you do that, you can't erect the tent. And if you don't erect the tent, you can't weather the storm. So think about struggle is not always such a, a, a bad thing. Actually, the way the Bible talks about struggle, it's kind of a good thing. Hebrews chapter 12, verse four says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving or in your struggle against sin. So we struggle, are you struggling against sin? I hope you are. I hope you're not just giving in to sin. Struggle is not a bad thing. Philippians chapter two, verse 12 says, so then my beloved, just as you always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. As you're working out your salvation with fear and trembling, you're struggling and struggling is a good thing because that helps us to, to fortify, to strengthen our salvation. And we're working through all that. So don't think about struggle as such a bad thing. There are four basic struggles that you will go through, or actually you'll, you'll go through probably one of these. You could go through two, you could go through all four, but everybody goes through different struggles. And so I wanna talk about the four basic struggles that we go through. And the first one is the intellectual struggle. Now each of these struggles is going to be answering a question. So the, the question that we're answering with the intellectual struggle is, is it true? Is it true that God exists? Is it true that the Bible is the Word of God? Is it true that Jesus was truly the Son of God? Is it true? This is the intellectual struggle. As an example of that, we'll go to John chapter 20. We all remember Thomas, doubting Thomas, as he has gone down in history as being known. And this is the, the passage where he became famous for that. John chapter 20, beginning together in verse 24, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my fingers into the place of the nails, and put my hand into the side, into his side, I will not believe. Now, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. 
when the other disciples had seen Jesus, Thomas wasn't there. And they told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He said, nope. <laughs> Not unless I touch him. I know where the nail scars were in his hand. I, I know where he got pierced with the spear in his side. Unless I see that, I, I don't believe it. And then he encountered the resurrected Christ face to face. Thomas, go ahead. You want to touch the side? You want to, you want to see my hands? Thomas' response was, my Lord and my God. The word here that he uses for God is theos. It's a word that was applied only to God. And he's calling Jesus God. You're God in the flesh. I know this. He truly believed. Whenever we go through the intellectual st struggle, and this was mine. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. When I was searching my faith, when I came to Christ, I did not believe that God existed. I didn't believe the Bible was from God. I thought it was just the words of men. I really didn't believe that Jesus, I knew he wasn't the son of God. I had serious doubts whether he was even a historical person or not. I believe he may have just been a fairy tale just made up. I, I had to have all that proven to me. Now, if you're not going through the intellectual struggle, you may be less patient with those who do have the intellectual struggle. You may be saying, well, they just have to, they just have to accept it. But let me explain. Some need the proof of the truths of Christianity before they're willing to yield to its guidance. And that's the way I was. I wasn't just going to throw my brains away and say, okay, I'll just start following the Bible. No, I needed to know what am I basing my faith on? This is a legitimate struggle. It may not be your struggle, but some people struggle with this. It's answering that question, is it true? Now, let me also give you the solution. The solution to the intellectual struggle is to test the Bible. Even those who are having doubts of the, about the Bible, I say, hey, go ahead and test it. <laughs> people have been testing it for 2,000 years. They still haven't found a mistake in it. I know some people claim that they found mistakes in the Bible, but... If you will search that out, I think you'll find out that they're not. The Bible will stand up for itself. And so test the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Go ahead and test the Bible. And you're going to get to that point that you're going to say, hey, I don't treat this like it's the word of men because that's not what it is. What this actually is, is the word of God. And all of our faith is based on the word of God. If this is not the word of God, then we are foolish people. But if it is, then others are fools for not following it. If this is the message from God Almighty, the God that created us, we need to be following what it says. But that may be your struggle, the intellectual struggle. Or maybe that's not your struggle. Maybe yours is the practical struggle. Now, the practical struggle is when you're trying to answer the question, what good is my faith? Maybe the intellectual struggle is that's not your problem. You say, okay, I believe the Bible is the word of God, but you know, what good does it do to follow this? Some really struggle with whether it is worth the sacrifice to dedicate one's life to the Christian ideals. That is their struggle. Okay, understand that, yeah, the Bible's from God. Yeah, God sent this book, but what's in it for me? Why should I follow this? Is it practical to be a Christian or is it impractical and I need to move on to other things? This is a struggle that some people go through with searching faith. Uh, Psalm 103 just nails this perfectly, and I love this psalm. Uh, I love all the psalms, but this one in particular is one that sometimes I've been down, and I go back, and I read this, and it just lifts me up. Psalm 103, look what the psalmist says, and the psalmist is David in this case, Psalm 103. Let's start in the second verse. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, 
who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. I'm not going to take the time to enumerate all the blessings that he lists there, but look at how many there are. Over and over and over again, it says God's blessed us this way and this way and this way. And so when you are struggling with what good is my faith, you need to think about the blessings of God. You know, the, there's an entire book in the Bible that is dedicated to the practical struggle, and that's the book of Job. And I'm not going to touch that right now because in a few class sessions from now, we're going to spend an entire class on Job. But that was his struggle. What, what good does it do? I, I did the right things. I still suffered. God, why is this happening to me? Of course, he lost everything and lost his health. And, and that's the practical struggle. But sometimes we go through, we think, is it practical to be a Christian? Well, if the practical struggle is your struggle, here's the solution. Weigh the pros and the cons. You may want to physically do this on a list, on a a piece of paper, just get it out and just, here's the pros, here's the advantages to being a Christian, here's the cons, here's the things I have to give up, here's the things that are difficult for me. And just weigh it out and then decide. Is it practical or not? You be the judge. But weigh that out. I think you will come to the conclusion that the pros far outweigh the cons. There are some hard things about Christianity. The the Bible never promises that following Christ is always going to be easy. But is it worth it? Well, you decide. That's the practical struggle. Maybe that's not your struggle. Maybe your struggle is the emotional struggle. Now, the emotional struggle is when you're answering the question, how can I let go of this, whatever this is? And this is different things for different people. Some struggle with this idea of how do I surrender? We have an example of this emotional struggle in Matthew chapter 19. And it's the rich young man. This rich young man who comes to Jesus, we'll start in Matthew chapter 19 with verse 16. It says, Someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good things shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbors yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete... Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. The real issue wasn't that he owned a lot of property. It's that he wasn't willing to part with it. You see, when he came to Jesus and he said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And 
Jesus brings up the commandments and he says, well, I've kept those. That's not an issue. What do I still lack? And Jesus says, I want you to go take all your possessions and sell it, give it to the poor, and then come back and follow me. You know, this is the only man in the Bible that Jesus ever asked to do that. He never tells all the others, go sell everything that you have and then come follow me. Why did he tell this man, you need to part with your money? He told him that because that's where this man had drawn a line in the sand. That's where he said, I, I'll surrender almost all. I'll surrender everything but my money gone. And whenever we do that, Jesus says, okay, that's the thing I want. It may not be money for you. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's a relationship in your life or a series of relationships, a whole several uh, maybe it's your career. It could be any number of things. Your schooling, anything that you're saying, God, I'll give it all to you except this. You are having the emotional struggle. How do I let go of this thing? That's the question you're trying to answer in your searching to grow closer to Christ. Here's the solution. Apply the faith that you have. Here's how it works. Let's say that I am struggling with giving up sports. I'll pick that one because that was another one that was pretty big in my world. Maybe I'm having a hard time surrendering that over to Christ and I'm recognizing that I'm not going to be able to continue doing sports at least at the pace that I am and still have a relationship with God. For one, it's interfering with Sunday worship or or I'm not, uh, I'm not being a good person when I'm playing this sport. Maybe it's bringing out the worst of me. Any, whatever it is. If you decide that you need to give up that sport for Christ, but you're not willing to give it up, give up part of it. Cut back this or that, whatever it is. Uh, set some goals. Say, I'm going to trust God. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to play on Sundays. I'm just not going to do that. Give that up. Apply the faith that you have and then see what happens. And when that works, you see, okay, I did that. And actually, my life is better because I'm, I'm following God more and you know, I'm still enjoying the sport. Maybe you could give up a little more, a little more. And I'm not saying sports is evil and money's evil. These things are not evil unless they keep us away from God. And that's where the emotional struggle is. We know from Luke chapter 14, we need to surrender everything to Christ. That means we place it all in His hands. But it's still in our grasp. But we, we put it all, when we become Christians, we lift it all up to Him. Say, this is all yours, God. My whole life, everything, my time, my energy, my talents, my weaknesses. <laughs> it's all yours, God. The emotional struggle is when we're saying, it's all yours except for this thing. And then that's the thing that we're struggling emotionally with. And in your search, it's going to bring that out. It's going to come to light. This is an area that I'm really not surrendered to God in. And I need to surrender it. Apply the faith you have. And when you get more, apply that faith. And when you get more, apply that faith. Pretty soon you'll be able to get to that point where you can say, like we sing the song, I surrender all. That's the emotional struggle. Maybe that's not yours. Here's the fourth and final struggle. And these are not in any particular order, by the way, just things that we struggle with. Maybe yours is not the intellectual struggle. Maybe it's not the practical struggle. Maybe it's not the emotional struggle. You may have the moral struggle. The moral struggle is where we're struggling with, am I too sinful for God? I'm looking at the things that I've done in my life and I, I'm standing before a sinless and perfect God. How can I do that? This is the, the moral struggle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we get the impression that Paul had a moral struggle when he came to Christ, just from some of the things that he says. First of all, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he's talking about the gospel. We'll start in verse 3. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. And that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. 
that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to the apostles. And then last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I'm the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not proven vain. But I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach. And so you believed. Paul had a bit of a, a moral struggle here with, man, I'm a wretch. I used to persecute the church of God. You think you've sinned. Man, I, I ordered Christians to their death. How could God ever accept me? This is a pretty common struggle. Whenever we're searching on our faith, sometimes we feel like I'm just way too sinful for God. We feel like there's just no way God could ever forgive us for what we've done. It's a common struggle. What's the solution? Well, you need to realize that you cannot change, but you can be changed. You see, the moral struggles where we're saying, man, I, I just could never change. I'm just such a terrible person. You need to realize you're right. You can't change, but you can be changed. In other words, if you're just trying to do it on your own, you're going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You're going to fail again and again and again. You're not going to conquer that sin in your life. Not until you surrender and realize that God can change you. That's the solution to the moral struggle. Am I too sinful for God? Here's the hard part of the, about this one. It's true, I am too sinful for God. All of us are too sinful for God. I cannot change, but I can be changed. That's the solution to the moral struggle. We go through all these struggles. The intellectual struggle, is it true? The practical struggle, is it practical to follow Christ? The emotional struggle, I am too emotionally attached to this thing, I don't think I can let go of it. Or the moral struggle, I'm too sinful for God. As I said, you cannot go through searching faith without experiencing at least one of these struggles. And you may experience two, three, you could even experience all four of them. But searching comes with a struggle, but that's okay because struggle helps us to drive down the stakes, to wreck the tent so we can weather the storm. Now I've taught you the five basic levels of faith and I've taught you the four struggles of searching faith. And up to this point, it's been a lot of intellectual work. And if you have hung in there this long, I'm going to reward you in this next class because we're going to do a character study of Peter. And now we get down to the nuts and bolts of how do I use this? How do I use the five levels of faith and the four struggles of searching faith? So go back through your notes, make sure you know those, the five levels and the four struggles, because when we look at Peter, we're going to examine how Peter searched out his faith. And I think you're going to see in a very practical way Okay, now I see. And once I can show you how to do this with characters like Peter and Job, you'll be able to go through the Bible and see how people grew in their faith, and then you'll be able to see how you can grow in your faith. I can't wait for this next class. I really hope that you're going to be here for the next one. So uh, God bless, and we'll see you next time.